Good evening, family. Quick story as we begin tonight. Uh, you had to admire his commitment. He, he made the decision to attend. Uh, he wasn't going to miss it. Um, although the weather that day was terrible. Uh, steady rain, temperature in the 40s. Um, but because of the bad weather, he didn't get there quite on time. So he made his way in and it was kind of difficult to find a seat, but he did. He persevered. Um, although his seat wasn't very comfortable, he, he didn't leave and, and he didn't complain. His, his mere presence there just demonstrated his love and his commitment. Uh, despite the um, circumstances surrounding him, he was joyous the entire time. Uh, he enjoyed the presence of, of fellow believers who were sitting around him. Um, his attitude, his presence, uh, his enthusiasm, all reflected a very deep and abiding commitment. A deep and abiding commitment to football. Uh, he was at a college football game on a Saturday afternoon. By the way, uh, he didn't make it to church on Sunday morning. Uh, he was too tired from being at the ball game the day before. And besides, there was a 20% chance of rain and he didn't want to risk it. You know, we're starting a new series tonight, uh, four weeks. Uh, the idea and the material come from a book by a man by the name of Tom Rain Rainer. Um, Tom wrote a book and he, he simply entitled it, I will, um, not, I could, not, I might, not, I can, not, I should, but I will. And in his book, he, he focuses on nine traits of the outwardly focused Christian. Uh, we're going to look at four, four of those traits in, in the next coming weeks. And the first is simply a a commitment, uh, a statement that says, I will worship. You know, true worship flows from the heart in recognition and, and in response to the magnificence of Christ. And, and because we have an understanding of, of grace that's taught in the gospel in the New Testament. And, and while true worship always kind of manifests itself in the individual's response to, to the majesty of God, True biblical worship also manifests itself in experience with, with other believers as well. It's what we call corporate worship. Uh, we simply call it, you know, going to church. You know, the first really recorded episode of this going to church or the corporate aspect of, of New Testament worship we see in the Bible is recorded in Acts chapter 2. Just after Peter and the apostles preached the first gospel sermon and, and many were baptized into Christ and into the church, we read this in verse 46 and 47. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and sincere hearts, generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Notice that, or notice what going to church looked like for these folks. At first, it says they were devoted. Uh, and understand, this isn't some legalistic requirement. It isn't a box to be checked off. Uh, the word devoted actually means <clears throat> a motive of passion, of a motive of the heart, a motive of desire. It also says they were joyful because their focus was on God. They could only be joyful. You know, they didn't go for a worship experience they went to experience God in worship to him. They, they had humble attitudes. You know, they put others before themselves. They, they weren't there to complain that the music styles or the songs didn't meet their individual preferences or that the sermon was too long or too short, or that there were too many scriptures or not enough scriptures or that someone sat in their spot or someone's kid was too loud and distracting. They were there in humility before God and before others. And it said, because of all of this, they had favor with all the people. Now, the people there refers to those outside the church. In other words, the, with, with unbelievers. And God uses the, the joyful witness, the humble attitudes for an incredible result. Verse 47 says, and the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. The truth truly biblical perspective of corporate worship is really so different from how it's practiced in many churches today. Um, we don't go to church to get our self-centered needs met. 
Instead, we go to worship the one true God as we serve alongside other believers. In way too many churches today, leaders basically have to beg people to attend their worship services. But the list of inexcusable conflicts are many. You know, well, there's the football game, there's the kids' soccer game, there's the traveling basketball team, there's the weekend at the beach, or or the simple fact they stayed up too late on Saturday night and didn't get enough sleep before returning to work on Monday. Far, for far too many Christians, all other activities become mandatory while the worship of God corporately with other believers has become almost an optional afterthought. You know, <clears throat> in John chapter four, Jesus meets a, a Samaritan woman and, and you remember the story. They had this great conversation back and forth and, and she's amazed at Jesus. As a matter of fact, she goes back and tells everybody her village about him. But do you remember the last words to her in verse 23 and 24? He says, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. This is a stunning declaration of the commitment of worship. It's also an incredible statement of God's desire for us to worship him. You know, the worship of God by the New Testament believers would, would truly manifest itself after Jesus ascended. It is a priority to God, and it should be a priority for us as well. You know, there is no hint anywhere in the New Testament that this practice of, of corporate worship, going to church, was anything but a clear, expected, and joyous practice of all the believers. You know, our corporate worship is not one option among many. It should be a consistent and persistent practice of all believers. You know, no one knows for sure when it happened, but, but somewhere in the 20th century, you know, believers, especially in America, began to shift from an attitude of self-sacrificing service and worship to God to a consumer-focused, self-serving attitude and it's been a terrible shift for the church. Some, some have blamed it on the secularization of our culture, others uh, to a, a degradation or a loss of, of theology taught in our churches. Others say the local church has taken on um, such a corporate model that it's turned churches into a consumer-based organization. You know, while there are maybe some truth in, in all three, there is one thing we can know for certain. The focus of too many isn't God. Uh, we focused and we focus on our own selves and our own needs and our own preferences. I don't like that song leader. I don't like the songs he picked out. I don't like that preacher. That sermon was too long. It was too short. It was too boring. There was too many stories. There were not enough stories. Someone sat in my speak seat. They didn't, they didn't even speak to me at all today. The list goes on and on and on and on. You get the picture. Our time of corporate worship has become about me, myself, and I. My needs, my preferences, my wants. And it's hard to find God in this scenario because it's about us. It's not about God at all. You know, one of the definitions of corporate is pertaining to a united group assembled for a greater good. When we worship, we are focusing our hearts on God. And when we are corporately together worshiping, we are focusing our hearts alongside other believers. And there is something powerful about believers united together in worship to God. So what can we do to make certain we are truly committed to corporate worship, to going to church, if you will? How can we turn the focus away from ourselves and toward God. Rainer, in, in his book, suggests four things. And, and they're his suggestions. These are not biblical mandates, but I think they're good. <coughs> and, it, and it relates to us just making a commitment to ourselves, to God, about how we will enter into worship. And, and the, the first is simply this, to, to make a commitment. I will attend worship services. It, it's just that simple. And, and I, I understand. Listen, I, I, I fully get it. Okay, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir. Okay, if you're here 
and and you're in your connect group i mean you're committed not to, to more than just our corporate worship on sunday morning you're committed to this corporate gathering we're even doing on on sunday nights i understand that but and, and if you look at the numbers you know about 40 to 50 percent of our of our total number are engaged in these connect groups but but here's what i know here's what i know 40 to 50 percent of our congregation can change the attitude of the other 40 to 50 percent if the 40 percent have the right attitude it will translate into the other 40 percent so if we as that 40 to 50 percent make this commitment i will attend worship service then i hope it will bleed over into everyone else you see <clears throat> it, it becomes so easy to neglect the priority of of corporate worship Anything and everything becomes an excuse not to attend. You know, see what happens though when sports or entertainment or vacations have a lower priority than corporate worship. See what happens when you make a firm commitment to God that you will attend weekly worship services with the body of Christ. Second thing he suggests, I will pray before I attend worship services. Pray the night before, pray the morning of. Pray for a good attitude for worship. Pray for God to, to speak to you through his word and through your worship. Pray for others who will be worshiping with you. Pray for your family not to have any conflicts or to get frustrated before you attend. The third thing he says is make a commitment. I will pray as I enter the auditorium just before you walk in. I don't want to talk about any long and in-depth prayer, but, but go to God in your heart, in your mind. Pray again for your heart and for your attitude. Pray for your fellow believers again. Pray people will hear the gospel clearly. Pray that God's spirit will convict people of sin. Pray for all distractions to be removed from you. Pray that you can focus your worship on God and not yourself. Pray right, right before you come in. And, and fourthly, he says this, make the commitment to say, I will pray that I will be a worshiper instead of a judge. You know, we leave worship far too many times as if we've just judged an Olympic event. Well, I give the preacher a 5.5. Uh, the song leader, just a 2.1. Uh, comments around the Lord's Supper were, were definitely a 7.3 today. Oh, but those people in front of me, definitely no more than a 1.5. They weren't engaged at all. You know, if we leave with a judgmental perception, we probably haven't worshiped God. We've attended an event to entertain us. We need to pray that we will worship instead of judging aspects of the services or the people involved in them. You know, it's time for a, a corporate worship revolution. It's time to make that moment of, or those moments of gathered believers a priority in our lives. It's time to stop making worship attendance an optional activity. It's time to ask God to, to get our hearts right so we desire to worship him in, in, in a corporate setting, not because we have some legalistic obligation to do so just to check off a box, but because we truly want to. It's time to urge others in the congregation to make corporate worship a priority. It's time to truly commit. Can you make that commitment with me tonight? Can you say, I will worship? God bless.